A popular kindergarten teacher is shot dead in the driveway of her parents' home on Mother's Day. Today, almost four years later, the case is still unsolved. So who had a motive to want Rachel Del Tondo gone? Let's put this puzzle together, together. Wait. Good to see you. I'm Amy. Welcome to True Crime Recaps. Today, I want to take you to Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. It's a small community. Less than 10,000 people call it home, but it has big city problems. On May 13th, 2018, Rachel Del Tondo became the town's ninth unsolved murder. But before we talk about what happened that night, I want to tell you about something that happened two years earlier in February of 2016. Now, it may or may not be connected. I'll let you decide. It was almost two in the morning when police approached a parked car they thought was suspicious. It was in a secluded spot in an empty lot, it's like two in the morning, and the windows were fogged up. Rachel was behind the wheel. In the passenger seat next to her was 17-year-old Sheldon Jeter Jr. Now, she was a 33-year-old teacher in town. Sheldon wasn't one of her students, but it was it was strange. It was a strange scenario, especially since his seat was all the way reclined. But they insisted there was no funny business going on. They were just friends talking. Now, apparently, Sheldon had sent her Facebook messages that night, like begging her to come and talk him through some crisis. It could have been completely innocent, but... It didn't look good at all. Luckily, one of the officers was someone Rachel knew well. He was her friend Lauren's father, and she begged him not to make a big thing out of it. She was worried that it would get back to her fiancé, Frank Catropa, and, you know, he would be upset. Fun fact, the age of consent in Pennsylvania is 16, which means the two of them being together wasn't against the law, and there was no indication that they were doing anything illegal at all, and so the police agreed to keep it quiet. Now, Rachel had known Sheldon for years, ever since he was in elementary school. She was a substitute there at the time, but he was never in her class, but... That didn't matter. And she was pretty and popular and fun and all the kids knew her and liked her. By the time he hit 17, Sheldon was a star football player at Aliquippa High School. He was being scouted by colleges even, and there was no shortage of girls around him, but he seemed to have his sights set on Rachel. A year after their late night visit, their friendship came back to bite her. Now get this. More than a year after finding Rachel and Sheldon in that car together, the police wrote up an incident report about it in late April, early May of 2017, just kind of out of the blue. According to the Beaver Countian, the chief told reporters they did it, quote, in case someone got wind of it. Well, in October of 2017, someone did. A lot of people. The school she worked for, the media, her friends, even the mayor. They got two anonymous emails alleging something unseemly happened between Rachel and Sheldon that night, and the police tried to cover it up. The sender also included copies of the file, which included their social security numbers, phone numbers, addresses, birth dates. It was a total invasion of privacy. The state troopers opened up an investigation into possible leaks in the town's police department, and Rachel was cooperating with them. That investigation later bloomed into more of a like a corruption investigation, and that's a key point. We're going to bring it up later. Unfortunately, the allegations alone were enough to get her suspended from her teaching job, and to this day, no one has stepped up to claim responsibility for sending that email. Interestingly, just days before those emails went out, Frank had requested a copy of that incident report. See, a few months earlier, a mutual friend had spilled her secret. When he asked her about it, she reassured him Sheldon was just a friend, she was only helping the kid get through something, and she said that they were parked outside the Circle K the whole time. Unfortunately, that wasn't exactly the case. And Frank dwelled on her story for about a year before he went down to the station to read the report for himself. And when he did, he realized the car was not at the Circle K, and that was the bitter end of their eight-year relationship. Six months later, she was murdered. 
On the same night that she was spotted with Sheldon in 2016, Frank and his friends were at the Super Bowl in California. Now, later, he let it slip that there were also some exotic dancers keeping them company. And Rachel was livid. But technically, their relationship had been slipping for a while. Now, the two of them met in 2010, and they quickly became the it couple. She had the looks and the charm. He had the money and the connections. One local website even nicknamed him the Wolf of Aliquippa, you know, because of the movie, and because he built several successful businesses, including one of the largest direct marketing companies in the U.S. Now, together, they made this picture-perfect team, but you know what they say, looks can be deceiving. The trouble was that Frank just wouldn't commit. At the five-year mark, she'd been dropping heavy hints about a wedding ring for a long time, and finally he gave in and proposed to her in Paris. On the flight back, she was proudly sporting that 16-carat engagement ring and talking wedding dates. She got the $10,000 dress, she got the $3,000 shoes, but there was a catch before she could walk down the aisle with her Prince Charming. She had to sign a prenup. At first, she agreed, whatever it took, but after some discussions with her family, she changed her mind, but Frank refused to budge. No prenup, no wedding. So just like that, the engagement was off. And for the next three years, their relationship status wasn't necessarily off, but it bounced back and forth between like engaged again, engaged to be engaged, not even speaking. The problem, well, not so much a problem as an obstacle, was Rachel's family. When he broke off their engagement, they were upset for her, as one would be, and Frank became persona non grata, like he who must not be named, but she was still seeing him. It's just that now she had to sneak around and hide it. You see, Rachel was still living at home. She came from a traditional Italian family, and that's what you did if you were an unmarried female, or at least That's what she did. That's the explanation she gave her friends when they asked her why she didn't get her own place if she didn't want her parents to know that she was still dating Frank. And then their relationship fell apart for good after that incident report was leaked. The trauma of all of it put her in a psych ward for three days, according to what her mother told 48 Hours. When she was discharged, she kept a low profile. Frank wasn't really in her life anymore, but Sheldon was. The two of them were still texting and talking, and by December 2017, she had started dating his older half-brother, 31-year-old Rashawn Bolton. It wasn't unusual for the two of them to spend time with Sheldon and another brother of theirs, 26-year-old Tyree Jeter. In fact, Tyree was with her on the night she died, but Sheldon was... Definitely not pleased about her relationship with Rashawn. And Rashawn even talked about a time three months before she was killed when Sheldon came up to them and even kind of threatened Rachel about like why they were together. It was a little bit, it was strange, he thought. But let me get back to the night she died. Her friend, Lauren Watkins, was also there with her. If you remember, Lauren's father is the officer who found Rachel and Sheldon in the car together that night. He was later put on leave and demoted from sergeant back down to patrolman because of his involvement in this case. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go on. Interestingly, Lauren was only 17 at the time of the murder, but despite their age difference, she and Rachel were close. Now, before she was shot, she told Lauren, Sheldon, and his brothers that she was an informant and she was planning to testify about police corruption in front of a grand jury. There was a grand jury investigation into county corruption going on, which included the chief of police and several officers, but the district attorney says Rachel wasn't scheduled to be a witness. So whether or not she was going to be called to testify at another time or she was maybe exaggerating her role in the investigation, that's unclear. But when she talked about it, she claimed that she had information that would take down some shady officers in the department. She also hinted that she had something on her ex-fiance, Frank. Although she never offered any specifics, she made it clear that she was afraid of him and the police. Now, he was the son of a former officer and he was a big shot in town. She told people she thought that they were following her. Frank denies this, by the way. And she said she'd gotten anonymous death threats. Her mother reached out to a local news site called the Beaver Countian to let them know that they should talk to Rachel about her allegations. When reporter John Paul got in touch with her to hear her out, she told him she was working with the state police and the organized crime team in the attorney general's office. 
She talked a lot about payoffs and corruption, but she didn't have any concrete proof that he could work with, and the story went nowhere, until, of course, she turned up dead. But in his opinion, her murder had nothing to do with her conflicts with the police. He thinks it was personal. On the night of May 13th, Mother's Day, 2018, she went out with Lauren. They like to just drive around, listen to music, and talk. Now that night, they stopped at the Circle K to say hello to a friend who worked there. And at 9.20 p.m., they were back at Rachel's so she could change clothes. Then they decided to go to a local place called Hank's for ice cream. On the way, they picked up Tyree Jeter, Sheldon's other brother, but Sheldon himself was out. He was texting them the whole night, though. He was getting updates about where they were and what they were doing. It was about 10.30 when Lauren and Tyree dropped her off in front of her parents' house. Before driving away, Lauren waited for Rachel to get to the door. She didn't notice anyone else around when she left, but four minutes later, witnesses heard shots ring out. Rachel's body was laying at the foot of the driveway as if she had been standing there talking to someone she knew before she was killed. Since all the bullets were fired at close range, the person she was talking to was most likely her killer, but no one saw the shooter. The first person they looked at for it was Frank, naturally. Not only was he her ex, but he was also someone that she had very publicly been saying that she was afraid of. But he had an alibi. He was with his new girlfriend. She's now his wife, incidentally. Now, three days after her death, he called a press conference and very publicly denied any involvement. And surveillance cameras in the parking lot where he left his car and the building's apartment manager, as well as the girlfriend, now wife, they all confirmed that yes, he was at home. Now, Lauren was also interviewed and cleared. So real quick story about Lauren and her father here. When they found out that shots were fired at Rachel's house, they came rushing over to the crime scene. The cops were already there. The place was already taped off. But her father, who is a sergeant in the police force, went kind of barreling into the crime scene. This really upset the officers that were handling it because he was off duty. He, you know, he... It wasn't his case, so many reasons, and they were afraid that it was going to be contaminated. So they actually filed a complaint against him, and then he was put on administrative leave while they investigated it. At the end of that, he was demoted to, from sergeant to patrolman. Tyree was also interviewed and cleared, and Rashawn, he was out of town that night. He was also interviewed and cleared. But Sheldon was a different story. When he was questioned, they noticed that he showed almost no emotion when they told him that she was killed. He claimed he got home around 10 that night, and that's where he was, playing video games when it happened. But police say his phone's GPS signals and surveillance cameras around town put him close to her parents' house at the time. But with no witnesses to the shooting, they needed definitive proof that he was there. But at that point, immediately after the shooting, Sheldon seemed to be their main suspect. But then at the end of May 2018, a letter was sent to the jail cell of a county inmate. It was supposedly written by a friend of his who saw everything that happened to Rachel that night. And according to this source, her killer was an Aliquippa police officer. And when they got wind of that, the department recused themselves from the case and handed it over to the state police. Two months later, the inmate admitted that he made it all up to get a plea deal, which incidentally, he did get. But even though the letter was fake, many people still thought that some corrupt officers may have been involved. But then in May 2020, almost two years to the day after she was shot, Sheldon was arrested for murder, but not Rachel's. The victim was a close family friend of his by the name of Tyreek Pugh. He was shot seven times. When Sheldon was first questioned, he denied even being with Tyreek that night. But when they showed him surveillance footage of the two of them leaving the house together, driving around the area where he was shot, then Sheldon coming home alone minutes after some, a passerby called 911, mm, he called his lawyer. When they searched his room, they found the gun used in the shooting under his mattress and gunshot residue was on his steering wheel and car door. The one piece of damning evidence they didn't have was a motive. In Rachel's case, the prosecution's theory was that Sheldon was obsessed with her and jealous about her dating his older brother, Rashawn. In this case, Tyreek was living with him at his grandfather's house. The two of them were closer than friends. They called each other family. In fact, Sheldon's whole family thought of Tyreek as one of their own. 
So what could have upset him so much that he killed him? Even after he was found guilty and given life without parole in July 2021, he's never hinted at any reason why he did it or if it had anything to do with Rachel. His lawyer told 48 Hours they were offered a plea deal if he would confess to Rachel's murder, but he refused. He also continues to insist that he didn't shoot his friend either. And that is your recap. As of now, no one has ever been charged with her murder. But what do you think? Do prosecutors have it right? Is Sheldon responsible for both deaths? Or did her involvement with the investigation into this police department lead to her murder? I want to thank you so much for spending some time with me today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please subscribe and give this a like so you never miss a recap. Chris and I are here every week with new stories. You can also catch us on Facebook, TikTok, and the gram. We're in your phone. I will see you soon.